Hello and welcome to worship. It is good for us to come together in this way to worship our God, to give thanks and to raise our prayers and hear the word of God together. I invite you to bring up the worship guide, whether on your screen or uh, to print it out so that you can follow along with the words and songs of worship today and participate in that way. Whether you are on your own or with others in your household, you are sharing this time of worship with the community of Advent Lutheran that stretches um, in many parts of the globe. We are grateful to gather together, and I am Pastor Anita Warner. I serve as pastor of this congregation, and I'm leading today with Vicar Brandon Peck and with Troy Gunter as our accompanist, and we thank John and Kathy Hopkins for supporting with technology today. We begin worship with a prelude offering from Troy.
guide that is noted in the comments or is on the Advent Lutheran Church website. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. O God, our defender, storms rage around and within us and cause us to be afraid. Rescue your people from despair. Deliver your sons and daughters from fear and preserve us in the faith of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord.
writes concerning the righteousness that comes from the law, that the person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that comes from faith says, do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, on your lips and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart and so is justified, and one confesses with the mouth and so is saved. The scripture says, no one who believes in him will be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how are they to call on one in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in one of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim him? And how are they to proclaim him unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 14th chapter. Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side of the Sea of Galilee while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me! Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, you of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I invite the children to come near for the children's message. Good morning, I'm happy to be with you in this way, and it's good to gather together. That story from the Gospel that I just read about Jesus and about Peter going out to him even though he was anxious and scared um, reminded me of something, and especially when Peter started to do something brand new in this case, walking on water, something I've never really done. Probably you haven't either. But even something not so unusual as that, when you try something new, it takes some bravery, some courage to try something new. And sometimes in the middle of trying it, we might get scared when we realize, I don't know if you know how to ride a bike without training wheels yet. But maybe, maybe you've 
already done that, and maybe you're thinking about doing it. But if you've already done that, think about when you're going along for the first time without training wheels, and maybe you realize partway through, oh my goodness, I can't believe this, it's a little scary. Maybe something's going to happen. Or, like the first time you try swimming out in a pool, as when you're learning how to swim, partly you realize, I'm not sinking, but I haven't done this before either. Or maybe someone is being a bully, and you are standing up and telling them that um, you think that they should be kinder in what they're saying or doing. And partway through that, however they're responding to you, you might realize this is a little scary. What's wonderful is that God has made us so that we can do new things and we can take heart. And that's the gift of God, that even when you're doing something new that's hard, God makes you able to do it and able to uh, learn and take heart and take confidence that it's possible for you to do it. Um, that is how God made you. And Jesus is with you, taking your hand and helping you do new things and hard things, no matter how they turn out. Sometimes you have to try again and again to do them. But God is our help and helps us with that. I'm reminded of a prayer because sometimes it feels hard to do things and this is called the Breton Fisherman's Prayer. I like this, the way a child wrote it up. I don't know if you can see it from there. It says, Dear Lord, be good to me. The sea is so wide and my boat is so small. Should I go closer? So you see a big wide sea and a sun overhead and a small boat out on the sea. And sometimes we feel that way and we can pray that kind of prayer, just like those fishermen prayed. And let's pray it together right now. Dear Lord, be good to me. The sea is so wide and my boat is so small. enjoy water skiing very much. For me, there is nothing like skimming across the top of the water, wind on my face. Once I'm confident enough in my balance, crossing over the wave, zigzagging, trying to keep the right tension in the rope and weight distribution over the ski, looking out for swells in the lake, looking over at the water and the shore, my run on the ski ends either with a wipeout or when I'm tired and signal the boat driver that I'll be dropping the tow rope that's been pulling me all along. I only have the opportunity to water ski every few years, but I've been doing it for 40 years, so I keep going out whenever there's an opportunity. <laughs> it's not quite like riding a bike, though. Most people, after riding a bike for a while, feel pretty confident. Every time when I jump out of the boat and into the water with my ski vest on, swim over to situate the rope and the ski and myself in position, I'm resting, balancing, letting the ski vest keep me lifted, I have this moment of fear. What will happen when the driver hits it and the rope tightens? Will I be able to hold on? Will I pitch forward or sideways? How hard will my fall be? Even though I've done this before, I've never skied under this weather and water conditions exactly, or in this lake, or with this boat driver, or with how I'm feeling right now. Plus, even though there are people in the boat rooting for me, it feels like I'm out here alone apart from them. 
all these feelings and thoughts come, and then the pull forward comes, and one of those things happens, or else I get up and ski for a while. That's just a little situational anxiety on the water, and it's resolved within minutes. We are all in unprecedented situations right now that provoke anxiety, and they are not resolved within minutes. How does God come to us in anxiety and in new conditions when we are beaten down? Our scripture readings from the lectionary gives us stories today of Elijah in a cave and Peter on the water. Elijah had had the great success of defeating the cult of Baal that was followed by Queen Jezebel. It was a religion that put wealth and productivity at the center of life and demanded that everyone sacrifice to the god of production. Elijah, representing the god of Israel, had challenged this god and instead claimed primacy for the Lord God, Yahweh. Elijah won the challenge. Rains, which had been shut up, the skies had come down again. But now, Elijah was on the run because of a credible threat against his life from the enraged queen. God had provided him food and rest already, and now he is hiding out in a cave and is depressed. The voice of God comes to him, asking, What are you doing here, Elijah? Elisha responds with a complaint. Here is everything I've done, and no one else is doing their part. There is so much opposition, and I'm on my own. God invites Elijah outside to witness displays of powerful acts of nature, a rock-splitting wind, an earthquake, and a fire. And we read, the Lord God was not in the wind, nor in the earthquake, nor the fire. This is worth noting for those who think God sends every disaster to make some kind of point. God was not in the earthquake. Then what followed is a phrase that is basically untranslatable, but is here translated the sound of sheer silence. This suggests to me a transcendent or mystical experience. In any case, within that sheer silence, the voice of God was heard, repeating the question, what are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah repeated his complaint, word for word. Apparently, this was his internal chatter that wouldn't be stilled. This was his story, his wound, his grievance. God brought him to a place of profound stillness in which he got this chatter out of his system. And there Elijah heard his own voice, justifying himself before God with recounting his own heroic efforts. Have you been in that place? Holding on to the story demanding that you be heard, telling anyone who will listen, including God, what you have done and how much has been done to you. Elijah, having done so, having been asked twice by God, what are you doing here, Elijah? Or maybe, what are you doing here, Elijah? Or maybe, what are you doing here, Elijah? finally loosened his grip on his attempt to justify himself, his life, his actions. Elijah stood alone in the silence with God, finally let go of justifying himself. Silence in our lives can do the same in us. 
a right relationship with God is not something we achieve through our heroic efforts. It is a gift received in faith in Jesus Christ. The word that is proclaimed to us creates faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Often we must come into a still and silent space in order to hear and receive this saving word. Once Elijah was stilled, he was invited out again in a new way, not in the same way in which his life had been. He was invited to take up and mentor the next generation of leaders, to call them out, to call them in, to support their service in the name of God. After Jesus and his disciples fed multitudes, as we heard from the Gospel reading in Matthew last week, he again went away to have his own time of prayer and grief following the execution of John the Baptist. The disciples went away too, by boat. When I was at the Sea of Galilee eight years ago, our local guide, Johnny, said that often choppy waters on the lake can become white caps. This is a pretty usual occurrence on that sea. I expect Peter and the other fishermen were used to those kinds of waves on the water. And so what frightened them in this story was not the choppy seas, but the appearance of someone walking across the water to them in the early morning after a rather rough night. They cried out in fear at this sight. And Jesus said to them, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. The righteousness that comes from faith, Paul says, do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven as if to bring Christ down to us, or who will des descend into the abyss that is as if to raise Christ from the dead. Rather, the word is near you, on your lips and in your heart. The word is on your lips when you sing, when you pray, you say, save us, we pray as we will in a few minutes. The word is in your heart. Take heart, Jesus said. Another way to translate these words of Jesus to the disciples is, have courage. It is in the present tense, in the now. Jesus is not saying here, buck up. Be brave, have fortitude for crying out loud. Where's your gallantry? The root meaning of the English word courage is the Latin core and the French cur, heart, which may explain the English translations that vary between take heart and take courage. What is Jesus saying to Peter and the disciples? I wonder if Jesus is saying to them and to us, Faith means living out of your heart. Courage means living out of your heart. You are going to have to lead, live, and love with your heart, Peter. You know who I am. Deep down in your heart, you know me. And you know I will be there. Trust me. Trust yourself. Trust your heart. Jesus' words call Peter back to himself, to his truth, to his heart, to his faith. And no valiant feat, like following Jesus out on the water, is necessary to verify what Jesus wants Peter to see is already true. I have a feeling this is something we need to hear as well. When a storm is shaking the boat of your life, when you wonder about what you're seeing, what you're hearing, when you wonder about Jesus' presence and have a hard time recognizing him, when he doesn't look the way you expect him to look or be, take heart.
live out of your heart in love for God and love for others. Take heart and move into or keep using the gifts God has given you to exercise in the world, even though the outcome may not lead to impressive statistics about you or your work. Trust yourself. Trust your innermost space, your heart, that what you are doing matters, and that truly Jesus is with you and has entrusted your life, your ministry to you. Sure, there may be times when you feel like you are walking on water, or at least think you can, no problem, what a great feeling. But in the end, only Jesus manages such a miracle. Daily life is not extraordinary acts of faith, but stepping out with the little faith we have and reaching out for Jesus every time we're sinking down. Notice that while Peter encounters a lot of uncertainty in this story, when he sank into the water and said, Lord, save me, Jesus immediately took hold of his hand. In the storm, Jesus will pull you out and keep you from sinking. The storm will pass. You will get to follow him into another day until all the storms have stilled and your heart your courage is living fully in the heart of God, in the fullness of the presence of Christ. In the stillness and in the storm, complaining or performing or flailing, take heart. The saving word is near you, with you, and for you. together with our hymn of the day, Precious Lord, Take My Hand. Confident of your care and upheld by the Holy Spirit, 
We pray for the church, the world, and all in need, responding to each petition with the words, Save us, we pray. For your church throughout the world, we pray. Strengthen the faith of your people. Speak to us through your word of power and mercy. Abide with those who are isolated from others. Give wisdom and stamina to all preachers who bring your good news to the world. Hear us, holy God. Save us, we pray. For the well-being of your creation, we pray. Protect waterways, forests, lands, and wildlife from exploitation and abuse. Tame the storms that threaten human habitations and maintain the health of our pets. Hear us, holy God. Save, Save us, we pray. For the leaders of nations, we pray. Inspire those who govern to keep peace with their neighbors and to maintain justice for their citizens. Calm the world's violence. Strengthen the democracies. Hear us, holy God. Save us, we pray. For those in need, we pray. For those who are unemployed, or homeless, or hungry, or hospitalized. For those whose money has run out. For those who are fearful of the future, and for those we name before you now. Catherine, Julie, Tracy, Tom, Marjorie, Marcia. Hear us, holy God. Save us, we pray. For the world facing the coronavirus, we pray. Sustain medical workers for their arduous tasks. Assist our Congress and governors in legislating wisely during this pandemic. Give wisdom to educators as they plan the fall semester. Give us kindness and understanding with one another and patience for ourselves. Hear us, holy God. Save us, we pray. For the end to racial injustice, we pray. Frustrate all prejudices between peoples that are based on ethnic origin or skin color. Unite into one body all who share this land. Hear us, holy God. Save us, we pray. For ourselves, we pray. Reach out your hand to us. Save us when we are sinking. And receive now the petitions of our hearts, those spoken in our homes, and those in the comments. We ask your mercy for the people of Lebanon suffering from the explosion in Beirut. Hear us, holy God. Save us, we pray. We praise you, O oh God, for all who have died in the faith, for martyrs, for leaders in the struggle for civil rights, for victims of COVID-19, and for those dear to us. Bring us at the end with all your saints into everlasting life. Hear us, holy God. Save us, we pray in the certain hope that nothing can separate us from your love, we offer these prayers to you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. In this time when we are unable
able to gather together to share in the Holy Communion, we pray together the words of the prayer for union with Christ. Let us pray. In union with you, blessed Jesus, I long to offer you praise and thanksgiving for creation and all the blessings of this life, for the redemption won for us by your life, death, and resurrection, for the means of grace and the hope of glory. In believing that you are truly present in the Holy Sacrament, and since I cannot at this time receive communion, I pray you to come into my heart. I unite myself with you and embrace you with all my heart, my soul, and my mind. Let nothing separate me from you. Let me serve you in this life until by your grace I come to your glorious kingdom in an unending peace. Amen. And now using the words of the language of your own heart, we pray together the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Following this worship, we invite you, if you would like to say hello to one another, to check in with our online coffee hour. It is through a Zoom meeting that you can access by computer or phone. And uh, so the link is in the comments following this and also in the Friday email. We invite you to participate as you would like to do so. Um, also, we invite your offerings for the ministry of our congregation. You may make those online through Advent's website or by mailing them into the P.O. box so that they arrive in the church office in physical form. Neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. God the Creator, Jesus the Christ, and the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, bless you and keep you in eternal love. Amen. Amen.
Go in peace. Christ is with you. Thanks be to God.